In my previous clip, I talked about the example of Kosovo. In the late 1990s, there was a um, conflict in Kosovo, and in response, the UN Security Council adopted Resolution 1244. But before that, that before the adoption of Resolution 1244, there was an important event. From March to June 1999, NATO North Atlantic Treaty Organization conducted airstrikes against the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, which was at the time led by this man, Slobodan Milosevic. And NATO's operation was named Operation Allied Force and it lasted for 78 days. And this picture shows that one of the biggest cities in Serbia was on fire because of NATO's airstrikes. So the question is, is NATO operation legal under international law? Well, it doesn't look like a case of self-defense because NATO countries were not the victim of an armed attack, if you remember from the self-defense video clip. And there was no Security Council authorization either. So the central question is whether or not international law would allow humanitarian intervention. Well, NATO's operation was primarily uh, justified for the purpose of preventing violence against uh, Albanians uh, in Kosovo to protect uh, the, the safety of, of, of Albanians and to stop violence against them. And on this issue, uh, the permissibility of humanitarian intervention in international law, I have to say opinions are quite divided among scholars and also practitioners. On the one hand, there are some people who say, well, under, international, under contemporary international law, the doctrine of humanitarian intervention is, is simply not permissible, is simply not accepted. And on the other hand, there are people who say, well, already at the time NATO conducted airstrikes in 1999, the doctrine of, uh, doctrine of humanitarian intervention was accepted under customary international law. And there are people who are sort of in the middle who say, well, because of, the, because of NATO strikes, airstrikes, and the political support given to NATO airstrikes, now uh, the doctrine of humanitarian intervention is emerging under customary international law as a new exception to the principle of the non-use of force. So I want to look at these three positions in turn. So first of all, there are people who take a negative approach to the principle of the, of, uh, the doctrine of humanitarian intervention. So for them, if you look at the UN Charter, simply there is no legal basis to allow uh, for, there is no legal basis for unilateral humanitarian intervention. And humanitarian intervention would go against the territorial integrity and although it is true that one of the purposes of the United Nations is to promote respect for human rights, but the protection of human rights cannot be invoked as a justification for the unilateral use of force. And it is indeed true that there is now um, a norm called international norm called the responsibility to protect and often known as R2P, perhaps you have heard of it. And this, the concept of the responsibility to protect was put forward by the report prepared by International Commission on Intervention on State Sovereignty in 2001. And in this report, well, in, in essence, the Commission said that sovereignty, uh, state sovereignty, would entail responsibility. So if one state uh, is unable or unwilling to protect its uh, individuals within its own, own jurisdiction, within its own territory, it, uh, the responsibility to protect would shift to the international community and this would also compromise the principle of non-intervention. And indeed, the, the concept of responsibility to protect was also endorsed by the UN General Assembly in its resolution, the, the World Summit Outcome document, adopted in 2005. 
But for those who take a negative approach to the doctrine of humanitarian intervention, or if you look at the, 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 the World Summit um, uh, outcome document, the UN Their, Their Assembly Resolution, the, re the responsibility to protect is very narrowly formulated and it does not justify, the, it, it cannot be invoked as a justification for a unilateral uh, humanitarian intervention. So that is somehow the, the position of the, those who, who deny the permissibility of humanitarian intervention. Uh, but on the other hand, there are people who say already at the time NATO, at the time when NATO conducted airstrikes, the custom of international law allowed humanitarian intervention. So those people will say, well, there are already precedent before 1999. For instance, in 1991 and 1992, UK, um, France, UK, France, and the United States, they created, they established no-fly zones in northern and southern parts of Iraq in order to protect Kurdish populations and other uh, oppressed populations in Iraq. And at that time, the British government justified the creation of no fly zone for extreme humanitarian need. So for those who endorse the, the, the legality of humanitarian intervention, the, because of these precedents, already in 1999, the doctrine of humanitarian intervention existed under custom international law. So, but at the same time, there are people who are sort of in the middle who will say, well, because of the political support given to NATO operation, although at that time the custom international law was um, the doctrine of humanitarian intervention was not fully established in 1999, but because of the support given to NATO operation, there is now uh, a new exception is now emerging under custom international law. So at the time in 1999, the, uh, especially the British government justified NATO operation as an exceptional measure on grounds of overwhelming humanitarian necessity. And in fact, uh, Russia this, uh, tried to pass a resolution before at the Security Council that condemned NATO operations. But the Russian draft resolution was defeated by as many as 12 member states, members of the Security Council at the time. And on top of that, many other states failed to condemn NATO operation. So for those who take uh, sort of the middle ground approach, because of, because of the precedent created by NATO operation, now a new exception to the principle of the non-use of force is emerging under custom international law. So I have overviewed sort of, sort of different approach to the, to the doctrine of humanitarian intervention. So I want you to think about which position is more persuasive than others. Personally, I tend to take a one approach, uh, sort of no negative approach to the doctrine of humanitarian intervention, especially when you think about the position taken by non-aligned movement. Non-aligned movement is a group of, of relatively smaller states, and they, are, they deny, clearly deny the, the existence of humanitarian intervention as an exception to the principle of the non-use of force. So because of the, their clear -cut, relatively clear-cut positions, positions uh, state practice and opinion juries are not enough even to sustain the emergence of new custom and international law. So I want you to think about which position uh, you find persuasive than, than more persuasive than others. So now you have watched uh, four video clips and thank you for doing that. And I have talked about the principle of non-use of force, uh, non-use of force under Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the UN Charter, and the two exceptions to that, the self-defense under 50, and Article 51 of the UN Charter, and uh, military enforcement measures, which are part of collective security under the UN Charter. And now I have talked about the doctrine of humanitarian intervention. 
And these topics are part of youth ad bellum, the law, um, the, legal, the legal basis for states to use force in their international relations. But these topics are different from the manner of military operations. So that is a question of use in bell, or sometimes called, out, called as international humanitarian law. So in my next clip, I'm going to talk about the aspect of use in bell, as opposed to use out of bell.